I'm so pleased and happy to see you all here today. I want to welcome you to this beautiful space. We really want people to feel welcome here. And, you know, it can feel a little odd to walk into a space and what do I do and am I going to know anyone? And Civic Saturday is a place where you should immediately be greeted and, and someone to tell you what, what it's all about and explain to people why you come back. If you brought someone with you today, just raise your hand. I know there are a few people. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That is the best way for people to find out about something because it's not always easy to get information uh, to everyone and so sometimes the same people find out about it. So tell someone that doesn't know about Civic Saturday, bring them with you. We'd love to add more chairs and more chairs. Um, now I would like to invite my friend and colleague Kayla DeMonte to the stage and we'll begin the program. Thank you all for being here. As Janae said, my name is Kayla DeMonte. I'm lucky enough to be a team member here at Citizen University. I want to tell you a little bit about what we do here at Civic Saturday and uh, what the purpose behind this gathering is. So as you may have heard us say before, we think of Civic Saturdays as a civic analog to a faith gathering. And the reason that we use that framework is because we're not just gathering here to learn about civics. We're here really to create new civic rituals together to create a civic community that we can learn from, lean into, lean on. And so what we're going to do here today um, is do just that, create some new civic rituals together. So we'll hear powerful poetry from our wonderful Civic Saturday poet, Na, who is around here. We'll be up in a moment. We'll sing together with the help of our friend Michael Feldman, who has been here before and we love. We'll have some additional members of the community here come up and share some readings. Eric Liu will deliver a civic sermon, and we'll also have some time to connect and reflect with each other um, in our civic circles. And why is it that we are doing this in this way? We believe that this moment calls for fellowship, calls for connecting around our common civic purpose. We're gathering in this way to challenge each other, to reflect with each other, and by being here, we are choosing not to succumb to the moral cynicism that has taken a hold of civic life. And we're declaring that there can be another way. And so we are building that here together. And we thank you so much for being here and building that with us. Yes. So before we dive into the program, um, we are so lucky to be here at this beautiful space at El Centro de la Raza. Let's give them a wonderful round of applause for hosting us. And I would like to invite up Elstella Ortega, who's the executive director here, to tell us a little bit more about the space. It's important to say what El Centro de la Raza translates into. It translates into the center for people of all races. And so we are honored to welcome you um, to El Centro de la Raza and the beautiful Plaza Maestas. And Nuestra Casa es tu casa. Our home is your home. And we hope that you take that um, to heart. Eric, we are honored to be considered uh, one of your friends. Um, our community is honored by that, but more importantly, um, we're honored that we are an ally in the struggle for justice um, for our community, and we feel very privileged to be hosting um, this event. We're also excited that um, Civic Saturday, uh, Civic um, Citizen University, uh, brings people from all races, perspectives, um, ideas, um, from all walks of life, and what that does, it is an expression of building the beloved community and also building our movement for justice, and we thank you, Eric, for that work. So please, a round of applause for <laughs> Eric Liu. So there is a beautiful quote um, by Jose Martí. Our Early Childhood Development Center is named for Jose Martí. He was a writer of children's books, but he's, he was also a revolutionary in the late 19th century. And one of his famous quotes is, is that in a time of crisis, the peoples of the world must rush to get to know each other. And that is exactly what we're doing here with um, 
Civic Saturday and hoping that um, you will reach out to other people and get to know them. So in the fall of 1972, almost 46 years ago, a group of people, um, individuals who were learning English, occupied this building. The story is too long for the, in the time that I have, but occupied this building and the and it began to be an oasis of hope for our community. And the way that we won the building was is that a multiracial group of people um, from all walks of life, all skin colors, the anti-war movement, and the faith community supported the efforts of this occupation. And that is why um, we won that building and we will forever um, be indebted to the community in general, and that's why every day in the work that we do, we are very deliberate about how we build multiracial um, unity. So fast forward to 2018, El Centro de la Raza has uh, 43 different programs in the area of children and youth, um, human and emergency services, skill building programs, housing and economic development, um, and obviously a lot of cultural and advocacy uh, work. We started um, almost 46 years ago. We knew that we needed to build an institution and that's what we've done and that we need to continue to build institutions that are powerful in our communities so that we can be strong enough as people and have the resources and power to fight the status quo. So again, thank you for being here. Um, this is your home. Gracias. Thank you so much, Estella. I love that um, the mission here at El Centro is so aligned with what we're doing here at Civic Saturday. We're so happy to be here, so thank you for that. Um, and with that, I would love to invite um, our poet, Na, up to the stage. I'm gonna go off with a quote also by um, Abir Jahani. <clears throat> it can be different to speak truth to power. Circumstances, however, made doing so increasingly necessary. Civic, relating to the duties or activities of people in relation to their town, is when we admit there is an imbalance between who gets proper food, water, health care, and shelter here. When we acknowledge each other more than we acknowledge everything else. When, when indecency and disrespect happens to one, it happens to all who are in the midst. Who wants to be in the midst of empty words with no actions? Who wants to be documented as a county with no community? We consuming the I in individuality. While the prefix uni means one, we cannot undermine the need for unity. Let this be a unanimous vote. That love doesn't have to be an attraction, but it can be intense. An intense feeling to want, demand, and make sure that you, me, we, get exactly what we need. Thank you. Thank you, Na. My name is Ben Phillips. I'm part of the team here at Citizen University. It's so great to be here at El Centro. This is the part of the program where you have a chance to get to know the folks sitting around you a little bit. So for the next eight minutes, we're gonna ask that you turn to someone, preferably someone that you don't know, and spend some time on this question. What worries you and what makes you most hopeful in civic life today?
There'll be more time to continue talking uh, later on. I'd like to welcome our friend Michael Feldman, who's going to lead us in song. If you are able to, uh, would you all please rise as we sing our first song? Five, six, seven, eight. Uh, this land is your land. so much. Y'all followed the bouncing ball perfectly. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is from Ella Baker, as quoted in Moving the Mountain, Women Working for Social Change by Ellen Cantero and Susan O'Malley, published in 1980. First, there is a prerequisite the recognition on the part of the established powers that people have the right to participate in the decisions that affect their lives. And it doesn't matter whether those decisions have to do with schools or housing or some other aspect of their lives. There is a corollary to this prerequisite. The citizens themselves must be conscious to the fact that this is their right. Then comes the question, how do you reach the people if they aren't already conscious of this right? And how do you break down resistance on the part of the powers that be towards citizens becoming participants in decision making? I don't have any cut pattern except for that I believe that people, when informed about the things that they are concerned with, will find a way to react. In organizing a community, you start with people where they are. You didn't see me on television. You didn't see news stories about me. The kind of role that I tried to play was to pick up pieces or put together pieces out of which I hoped organization might come. My theory is strong people don't need strong leaders. Good morning. This is from Let Us Now Praise Famous Men by James Agee, published in 1941. Human beings with the assistance of mules work this land that they might live. The sphere of power of a single human family and a mule is small, and within the limits of each of these small spheres, the essential human frailty, the ultimately human mortal wound, which is living and the indignant strength not to perish, had erected against its hostile surroundings this scab, this shelter for a family and its animals, so that the fields, the houses, the towns, the cities express themselves upon the grieved membrane of the earth in the symmetry of a disease. The, literally, the literal symmetry of a literal disease of which they are literally so essentially a part. The prime generic inescapable stage of this disease is being, a special complication of life. A malignant variation of this complication is consciousness. The most complex and malignant form of its known to us is human consciousness. Thank you. This is from someone named Pete Peterson, Rich Taffo, and others. And it's published in 2018, and it's titled A Way Forward, a, Cons a Conservatism of Connection. And it says, authentic conservatism is essentially about three connections. Number one, connection to the past. We reframe from our heritage what is, value, what is valuable and worth cherishing. Number two, connection to your future. 
We innovate as conditions change to adapt inherent ways to new conditions. Number three, connection to one another. Through America's frame mediating institutions, we connect to one another in achieving the common good. In his last major political address to the GOP convention of 1992, Ronald Reagan perfectly connected these three elements. We can no longer judge each other on the basis of what we are, but we must instead start finding out who we are. In America, our or origins matter less than our destinations, and that is what democracy is all about. American conservatism recognizes that today's crisis of spirit has repeated itself throughout our history. Episodes of alienation, estrangement not only punctuate our history, but also reveal our deepest ongoing challenge. America's gradual incorporation of an astonishing array of peoples and cultures into a common civilization is a true, powerful, and profoundly important story, even as each stage of that development as a nation has required us to overcome tragic periods of exclusion, particularly racial and ethnic exclusion. This too is an identity politics of a very dangerous sort, which must be rejected. We must restore the American project by repairing the three, the three conservative connections that demonstrate our principles and draw us into the risky but rewarding work of active citizenship. Good morning. So this is the Equal Rights Amendment to the United States Constitution passed by the US Senate and submitted to the states. March 22, 1972. Section 1. Equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on the account of sex. Section 2. The Congress shall have the power to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of this article. Section 3. This amendment shall take effect two years after the date of ratification. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Eric Liu. Uh, I'm the co-founder of Citizen University, and I'm so grateful to be with you all this morning. Uh, it is so gratifying, in particular, to be here at El Centro de la Raza, and particularly here in Plaza Roberto Maestas. Roberto, some of you may have known him, has been gone now eight years, but he remains very vivid to me in his gestures, the texture of his voice, his knowing and his mischievous laugh. I feel like I'd call on him for coffee later today, and we would sit out on Beacon, and he'd riff on all that's going on in our city. For those of you who never met Roberto, or have no idea who he was, or why this place is named for him, let me tell you a bit about Roberto Maestas. He was one of the best civic improvisers I ever knew. Born into poverty in Depression-era New Mexico, and raised by his grandparents, he ran away at age 14 and became a migrant farm worker in eastern Washington. Eventually, he hustled his way to Seattle and got himself through high school working odd industrial jobs and late shifts. He eventually earned a degree in Spanish at the University of Washington and became a teacher here at Franklin High School. It was here, it was at Franklin during the 1960s, that his evolution into a firebrand revolutionary began. He became a vocal leader in the emerging Chicano movement. He joined black student activist Larry Gossett, Native American leader Bernie White Bear, and Asian American leader Bob Santos to create multiracial coalitions for justice in education, policing, immigration, housing, and other issues. Together, they became masters of organizing and direct action. These so-called four amigos were bonded by personal chemistry, but they also recognized that in predominantly white Seattle, they were stronger together. This was, a particularly, this was particularly the case for Seattle's small and dispersed Latino community at the time. Maestas sought a way to galvanize Latinos into a visible sense of shared fate. So in October 1972, as you have heard, he and 70 other activists entered and took over the abandoned Beacon Hill School, which had been shuttered because of declining enrollments. The aging building lacked heat, electricity, 
running water or supplies, but it now had occupants, or at least occupiers. The activists proclaimed it El Centro de la Raza, which they translated strategically as the center for people of all races, not the race. And they secured a commitment from the school superintendent that they would not be forcibly evicted. And from there, they began to negotiate. As the talks got underway, the activists organized educational and artistic projects in this building, from, our, from, from English lessons and mural making to other forms of organizing, just to show what El Centro could be. They also organized rallies at the city council and in the streets. And along the way, Maestas and a young fellow occupier named Estela Ortega were married in the unheated school gymnasium. <laughs> Three months later, the district agreed to lease this property to the activists for $1 a year. From that point on, El Centro became a civic hub and a political force, combining the spirit of the urban crusader Jane Addams and the revolutionary Cuban poet Jose Marti. With a dose of the Black Panther Party, El Centro created a space for low-income immigrant families that was equal parts settlement house, people's school, child care center, free, free breakfast program, and activist proving ground. Maestas led with zest and swagger. He was unafraid to confront community leaders he felt weren't moving quickly enough to include poor and brown people. He marched and he protested, often with the other four amigos. But he also mastered the inside game. Feisty public challenges would be followed by subtle private negotiations. He cultivated working relationships with business and philanthropic insiders. And his office became a necessary stop for aspiring political candidates. By the time of the 35th anniversary celebration in 2007, El Centro de la Raza was serving many thousands of people annually through over 40 different programs. It had a strong presence as an advocate for immigrants and poor communities of color. It had become a conduit, a key conduit in the local power structure. Governors, mayors, council members all paid homage at this 35th anniversary celebration. And the restless maestas worked the room all night long. Well, Roberto died in 2010 of lung cancer. And Estela, who had been running things day to day, took over formally as El Centro's executive director. She would never say it, but Estela has become a full-fledged member of this city's power structure. She is wired into City Hall. She can make stuff happen, and she doesn't have to raise her voice to do it. Estela decided after taking over here to launch a legacy project, a festive plaza adjacent to that old schoolhouse that she and Roberto and others had once occupied with street level retail, a community center near the light rail, affordable housing for hundreds of low income residents. That project opened last year. This plaza is called Plaza Roberto Maestas, and here we are. Now, why did I spend so much time telling you about this place and this person and these people? Well, in part because I believe that memory matters and that it's important to honor our elders and those who build our institutions. But also because at every Civic Saturday, whether here in Seattle or in Nashville or Des Moines, Iowa or in Atlanta three weeks from now, our approach is to name the layers of history beneath our feet and to remind ourselves that there is never in America a truly blank canvas, never a second act that was not already somehow corrupted and perhaps consecrated by the first. But another reason why I tell you about Roberto and Estella is that they embody the spirit of perpetual revolution, which is, of course, the very essence of the American idea. Coming out of the liberation movements of the 1960s, they were at the practical, useful cutting edge of the counterculture. And I submit to you that we gathered here today are the new counterculture. In a culture, a dominant culture of celebrity worship and consumerism, we stand for service and citizenship. In an age of hyper-individualism, we practice collective action and common cause. In a time of fundamentalism and showy righteousness, we stand for discernment and humility. In the smog of hypocrisy and situational ethics, that emanates from the swamp in DC, 
we still live and breathe the universal timeless values and ideals of the Tao, of the golden rule, of the Declaration of Independence. That is radical. We who choose to show up on a Saturday morning for fellowship and friend making and skill building and power building, we are at the cutting edge of the counterculture now. If we do our jobs right, we will spark a great civic awakening all across this land, a renewal of people power and a replenishment of civic character. If we don't, we may realize and we may come to see that the decades that we have been alive will turn out to have been the blip, the exception, the exception to the rule, and that American political life will have returned to the nasty, brutish, corrupt condition of the 1820s, or the 1950s, or the 1880s. So today, in the countercultural spirit of Roberto, a spirit of play, of war, of art, and of love, I want to ask a simple question. Are we enough? Are we who gather here, and others like us who show up for Civic Saturdays, are we enough to undo the toxic effects of concentrating wealth and the culture of hoarding that has taken hold in America? Are we enough to fight the imperialism of the market and the addiction of tech-fueled narcissism? Are we enough to make our country live up to its promise to be a city upon a hill? And what about this city, this city built upon seven hills? Let me tell you today, let me tell you first why I worry whether we are in fact enough. And then let me tell you why I still have hope. When the great civil rights organizer Ella Baker said, strong people don't need strong leaders, she was referring obliquely to Martin Luther King, with whom she often disagreed over how hierarchical or decentralized the movement ought to be. Ella Baker is not famous today, but she was right. And the corollary, of course, to her comment, is that weak people do need strong leaders. One measure of whether we the people today are strong or weak is how susceptible we are to viruses. How robust is the civic immune system and how resistant are we to infection? The infection might be called racism or white nationalism or raw misogyny or nativist scapegoating. But the precursor virus that feeds all these infections and now deeply rooted in the body politic, that precursor virus is absolutism. Absolutism kills, and our viral load of absolutism is high and getting higher. This Monday, Jeff Sessions, the Attorney General of the United States, detailed a zero tolerance policy for people attempting illegally to cross the border into the United States. Every such migrant, he said, would now be subject to immediate prosecution. That got me angry. First, because many of these migrants are seeking asylum, which is not a punishable offense or a crime. But also because migrant, par migrant parents who are being detained as criminals are now, of course, being separated from their children. And because it was the cold-blooded goal of this administration to use these well-publicized separations as a deterrent to future migration. So I got angry. But then I got thinking, got to thinking about all the ways that zero tolerance is appearing in American life, in our law and our norms. And I realized that it's not just in this administration's immigration policies. It's everywhere. It started with zero tolerance policies in schools in the mid-1990s. Bring a gun to school or drugs and you'd be suspended. Boom. Bring a gun-shaped keychain to school or ibuprofen for menstrual cramps and you might be suspended too. Wait, what? This absolutist logic was a response to the anxieties of the day about crime and delinquency, about law and order, and let's be honest, about race. It found its way into three strikes you're out criminal laws and sentencing guidelines that made imprisonment without parole automatic. And even though now many people have come to admit that a generation of these policies has resulted in a school to prison pipeline in the United States that is feeding a new Jim Crow system of mass incarceration of brown and black men. Even though we admit that and see that, Americans have not fallen out of love 
with zero tolerance. To the contrary, our society is doubling down on it, and often in the name of social justice. Colleges, corporations, government agencies, and media outlets all have adopted zero tolerance policies against sexual harassment and assault, racism, bullying, hate speech. The omnipresence of iPhones and contagious righteousness of social media mean that every single day brings forth a new moral outrage, a new occasion for us all to declare there should be zero tolerance for this. As a mode of justice, zero tolerance has primordial appeal. It simplifies. It sends a clear message about where moral norms stand. It creates solidarity and power among those who assert and enforce those norms. When Roseanne Barr tweets what she tweeted, or when the video emerges of that Starbucks manager in Philadelphia calling the cops, or when it comes out that Harvey Weinstein is a power-abusing sexual predator, well, and when we share our outrage about all of these incidents on social media, when these things happen, it can feel immensely satisfying, viscerally satisfying, to have a hand in administering the real-time punishment of shaming and social banishment of these people. But if you've ever seen an episode of Black Mirror, a show on Netflix that depicts an eerie near future in which the state does not need to be authoritarian because the crowd is, you will know that that feeling should be a warning. The absolutism of our political culture today flattens the moral landscape. It smashes proportion and perspective and priority. Al Franken was not Donald Trump. Samantha B, who called Ivanka Trump the C word, is not Roseanne. Although MSNBC's Joy Reid, who it turns out has been peddling 9-11 truther conspiracies and cheered Iran's proposal to kick Jews out of Israel, she appears to be far more problematic than many liberals want to admit. But meanwhile, on the day that the internet went crazy about Roseanne, a report was published that over 4,600 American citizens died in Puerto Rico because of Hurricane Maria and this administration's half-hearted response to the storm. Who noticed? Who spoke? Who shared outrage? This unwillingness to make distinctions becomes over time an inability to make distinctions, which then clears the field for moral relativism, and indeed for malevolent moral relativism. Enter Donald Trump. One of his savant-like gifts is that he intuits by total instinct that he, more than anyone else, will benefit from the obliteration of moral proportion and perspective. That's why his response to the Roseanne flap was to pardon the bigoted, outrage-spewing felon Dinesh D'Souza. Cue the outrage to blunt the previous outrage, which will make us forget the previous outrage. Our troll-in-chief is both the product and the creator of a culture of blind moral fury. And the blindness of it all, this reflexive, contagious response of fury, makes authoritarianism in the United States ever more likely. In part, that's because this kind of a culture makes, creates a hard callus that starts to form over the nerve endings of our moral sense. John Kelly, the White House Chief of Staff, assured the public recently that the migrant children separated from their parents at the border would be just fine, that they would be, quote, put into foster care or whatever. No phrase better captures the casual indifference and savage ignorance, the dehumanizing sociopathy that trickles down from John Kelly's boss. To them and their base, the prime threat is migration of non-white people from shithole countries into the United States. And if, deter if deterring that threat means demonizing Central American migrants as criminals and misplacing children who shouldn't be here anyway, well, whatever. Callousness is not just about cruelty, though. It is about shamelessness. Shame is a necessary part of a moral repertoire. And the absence of shame is sociopathy. But when our discourse, I'm sorry, 
when our media entertainment mob of instant weaponized judgment is dominated by shame and attempts to shame, then eventually some part of the people will stop responding to shame altogether. They may even adopt an identity that takes pride in the thing, meant, in the thing that's meant to be shamed. The overuse of shame in civic life has an effect like the overuse of antibiotics and antibacterial hand sanitizers. Eventually, a resistant strain of angry, righteous hate emerges, and we become defenseless against the far more vicious infections that we see than we ever see in normal times. Now, the worst part of a culture of absolutism is that it absolves us of the responsibility to know our own minds, and then it strips us of that responsibility. Zero tolerance for unaccepted views is the mantra of a people who do not trust themselves to make good judgments. So they automate it, on, off, one, zero, black, white. Zero tolerance is the perfect mantra for an age when more and more of our social interactions are automated, mediated by algorithms, unthinking and undiscerning. We don't have to know what we think. We just need, we just need to know what we're supposed to think. And this isn't just about national politics. Consider the debate here about taxes and homelessness in Seattle. If you support the head tax, you despise business. If you oppose the head tax, you despise the homeless. Whichever tribe you're in, you despise the other. You should be ashamed to admit whenever the other side might have a point. And so you won't. But isn't it possible? Isn't it just possible, both, that Amazon and other big employers should be contributing more in taxes to address the consequences of unchecked growth, and that our city government should be far more effective at spending public money? Absolutist politics make pawns and symbols of people in a ping pong game of whataboutism. Trump separates migrant parents and kids, but what about Obama? Didn't he separate migrant siblings? Back and forth, on and on, while children remain lost or abandoned or trafficked into hell. Now that Seattle business leaders are pushing a referendum to repeal the head tax, we will argue in this town back and forth, on and on, over whether we want taxes or jobs, while the number of homeless families and the number of homeless deaths will keep on rising. I ask again, are we enough? You can see why I worry. I go around the country in my work telling a story that says as dysfunctional as DC has become, at least at the local level, people are resisting tribalism and they're resisting the Manichaean moral absolutism of national politics. That at, lo that at the local level, there is no time for the kabuki theater posturing and the virtue signaling of national politics. Because at the local level, you either are or are not going to get the problem fixed. And that in fact, it will be problem solvers from towns all across America who will save America. Well, I confess to you that I tell that story these days with slightly less conviction. Adam Smith, the philosopher, wrote about the, quote, moral sentiments that hold a society together. Alexis de Tocqueville described the, quote, habits of the heart that held a young America together. But here's the thing. Self-righteousness is as much a moral sentiment as duty and benevolence. Dehumanizing rage can be as much a habit of the heart as compassion. Habits are nothing more than what we keep on doing and what we keep on indulging. And we here in Seattle, because we have now become the most unequal city in the United States, surpassing San Francisco recently, we have developed the bad habits and the unhealthy moral sentiments that mark an ailing society. Our civic immune system here is faltering. When you see the chanting and the counter chanting at neighborhood meetings in the North End, or you see iron workers shouting down Shama Sawant, whose followers are often doing the shouting, you realize that we in this town have gotten infected. But let me tell you why, in spite of all of this, I still have hope. I still have hope because last month, our team at Citizen University 
went to New Orleans to lead our first ever citizen fest, a festive learning summit on civic power and civic character. We learned with and from so many unsung big citizens from the African American community there who have been taking down Confederate monuments, forming story circles to help people deal with the everyday traumas of life in the Big Easy, creating mutual aid networks to lift each other out of poverty, using step dance and chair fitness to boost health and civic health. And most of these folks were invited to this gathering by Denise Graves, a faith leader and organizer who is honored and respected among the poor families of the city and who has seen so much and who, just when it seems she has seen too much and has grown weary, will say something simple and loving in quiet response to someone's pain or someone else's ignorance, something that works like acupuncture for everyone's soul. Reverend Denise is the farthest possible opposite of President Donald. I still have hope because when we were in Des Moines, Iowa last month to lead a Civic Saturday, we met with educators in that state who are organizing and persisting even though they live in a state that 40 years ago outlawed teacher strikes and that 40 days ago stripped teachers unions of their leverage in collective bargaining by giving school districts and not arbitrators the final say in contract negotiations. They know that the fight now is to convince rural and small town school boards not to abuse their power. That Iowa must not go the way of Kansas and try to cut its way to teacher quality and quality schools. They labor under labor laws that remind you what a relative paradise for workers Washington State is. There's a lot going wrong here, but at least we in Washington have the right to have rights, which is, of course, at the heart of citizenship. I still have hope because this week, just Thursday, I went down to Oakland, and in a single afternoon, I got together first with Wendy McNaughton, an illustrator, journalist, and citizen artist, and we discovered that both of us had recently read Let Us Praise Famous Men. And we asked ourselves, what if we started collaborating the way that Walker Evans and James Agee did to create that pioneering, uncategorizable book of text and image about the sharecropping South during the Great Depression? And now, Wendy is hitting the road, traveling the country to go harvest stories of people changing civic life. Then after Wendy, I met with Ann O'Leary, who was a top policy aide to Hillary Clinton throughout the campaign. And in the wake of that upheaval is someone who has replanted herself in Oakland and refastened herself to civic purpose and found new ways to be of service. And later then, I met with Mia Birdsong, a teacher, an activist, an urban farmer who keeps three hives of bees in her yard and shares honey with her neighbors on her block, her block which has changed in just eight short years from 60% black to 10% black, but who remains, but where this block remains a place where her black children feel free still to run and play outside until supper time, till they're hungry. Mia, who organizes circles of African American women who push each other to work on what they've got to work on. Mia, who is writing a book now about, about how young people of color are reimagining and reinventing the very notion of family. And then, just yesterday, still in Oakland, I met with Jen Palka, who co-founded Code for America and who convened a summit with 1,000 citizen technologists who are using their digital savvy and skill to help ordinary citizens build power, fight for justice, and make government more responsive to the people. I told Jen and her brigades with Wendy in mind that these technologists and coders aren't just offering coding skills, they're offering artist skills, the skills of seeing patterns, improvising solutions out of limited resources, experimenting and adapting perpetually. And of course, these are citizen skills. I have hope because of Wendy and Anne and Mia and Jen. But I have hope also because women like them help make Illinois this week the 37th state of the union to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. And this means only one more state is needed to cross the threshold of constitutional ratification. Now, yes, the remaining 13 states are 
the former Confederacy, <laughs> plus Arizona, Utah, and Oklahoma. So not the most fertile ground. And yes, there is debate, legitimate debate, about whether too much time has elapsed since most of the states originally ratified. But remember, in 1982, when the last state had ratified, and for the next 35 years following, the Equal Rights Amendment was understood to be, a, to be dead, to be as dead as disco, the pinto, and 70s hairdos. It was dead until, until it wasn't anymore, until Hillary Clinton became the nominee and almost president of the United States, until record numbers of women decided to run for office, until Me Too, until a few citizens in Nevada last year and Illinois this year imagined what it would be like to get the ERA across the finish line. I also have hope because my colleague Pete Peterson, who's the dean of the public policy school at Pepperdine University in California, a Republican and former candidate for California Secretary of State, Pete has been organizing thoughtful reformers on the right for a movement called a conservatism of connection. A conservatism that does not worship the market, does not demonize government per se, does not scapegoat immigrants, but does make an affirmative case for why citizens empowered to help each other should be the solver of problems of first resort. Pete and I part on many, many policy questions, but his conservatism of connection, like our civic counterculture, is about a shared spirit and a shared sense of purpose that materialism and immediate gratification will never satisfy. Well, let me bring it home now. I still have hope because the improvisation and occupation that became El Centro, El Centro de la Raza in 1972 is now, nearly half a century later, the magnificent centerpiece of a vibrant Beacon Hill and a beacon for immigrants and people of all races. The murals painted on the walls all around us and the murals that were painted on the walls back then in 1972 have become the living, breathing, beloved community in the plaza today. I still have hope because with us here today, this morning, are some of the high school students from Bothell and Seattle and Kent and elsewhere who made the March for Our Lives happen spontaneously and who are now organizing Vote for Our Lives. a campaign to get high school students and others to register and to vote across the state. They are living proof of my third law of power, which is that power is infinite. In even the most seemingly stuck and rigged situations, it is entirely possible to generate brand new power out of thin air through the magic act of organizing. It is possible then to reset the equation of power. And I have hope because the other night, I gave a talk at the UW, convened by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Now, the Academy was founded in 1780 by John Adams and others during the Revolutionary War. And this was the 2068th stated meeting of the American Academy, which because I'm kind of a sucker for great lineages, just gave me goosebumps to hear that number. And after my lecture, what gave me hope was that one of the most thoughtful questions came from a man who, it turns out, is running against my friend Jamie Peterson, the state senator from the 43rd district. This fellow, Dan, is a conservative, a label that he emphasized over Republican, because he knows how toxic Republican has become. And he realizes, quite clearly, just how outnumbered he is in a district that centers around Capitol Hill in Seattle. But he believes that Seattle has gone tax crazy. He thinks that local government is out of control. And, like, and unlike others who might think the same thing or mutter the same thing, he is putting himself forward to challenge an incumbent state senator because he believes that's what a citizen ought to do. Now, I want to be clear. All these people from our city and from all around the United States don't make me optimistic. They give me hope. There's a difference. Optimism is appropriate for situations where you have no hand in the outcome. I'm optimistic that the Yankees, and the Mariners too, it looks like, will be in the playoff hunt all season long. 
But in my optimism, I'm only a spectator. Hope is appropriate for situations where you have something to do with the outcome. I am hopeful that our country and our city will not collapse into the hyper inequities of an extractive third world society. But that's only because I might have something to do with how things turn out. That's only because I can help shape the course of events. Hope implies agency. Hope demands that we not waste our power. Our agency, our authorship of this city and this nation yet to be written, depends on our mutual commitment to pledge our lives, our fortunes, our sacred honor to an ideal that says we're all better off when we're all better off, that treats liberty as a responsibility and not as a way out of responsibility. Our agency and our power are expressed in whether we will live like citizens and not customers, as an active people and not a passive mass. Will we love one another enough? Earlier this year, our team launched a civic seminary through which we're training and shaping two dozen leaders in 2018, ranging in age from their early 20s to their late 60s and coming from towns all across the United States to lead their own Civic Saturdays gatherings and to build their own community congregations. From their time together during seminary and from our collective questioning of the texts and the creed that compose the foundation of America's Civic Charter, they came to believe that just as all great faith traditions reduce in the end to love, American civic religion can also be distilled to civic love. And whenever we, our team, and the members of the seminary are in group texts or Facebook messages, we usually sign off with the hashtag civic love. But to love your neighbor can be very difficult when your neighbor is a selfish jerk who resists change, or a crusading ideologue who's forcing change on everybody else. To love your enemy can be difficult when you are arguing about what one of you thinks is a double standard and the other thinks is a single truth. To love a stranger can be difficult when radical inequality creates status anxiety, creates scarcity thinking, creates scapegoating. I'm telling you this to remind myself because I do not automatically love my neighbor or my enemy or my stranger or a stranger as myself. With malice toward none and charity for all is not my default setting. <laughs> and let's be honest, that's true for most of us. Even Abraham Lincoln said those words only after having made clear to the Confederacy in his second inaugural that he was quite willing to see that, quote, every drop of blood draw drawn with a lash shall be paid with another, drawn with the sword. Lincoln's morality was as much Old Testament as new. Will we then hold ourselves and hold each other to account lovingly when we are lapsing into absolutist binary ways of thinking? That takes commitment. It takes a social compact. And we hope that you, will, we hope that you have come here today. And if not, that you will perhaps leave here today with someone who can enter into a pact with you, a pact to call each other, a pact to call each other out when you start acting like cable and Twitter provocateurs, even when you actually agree with them. In fact, especially when you agree with those provocateurs. Will we know how to discern among shades of gray, even if doing so makes us seem insufficiently woke or unfashionably out of line with the party or the tribe or the people around us? Will we learn to listen to the people? And will we remember that we are the people? And so we must find our own voice and must know our own minds and our own hearts without cues or scripts supplied by others? Will we remember that democracy is actually no guarantee of freedom or of equality? That only liberal democracy is, and only liberal democracy with the spirit of a republic, which is to say, a spirit that says, I claim this, I must be this, I must lead this, I am the public. Will we be that strong people that Ella Baker spoke of? 
strong enough to keep our republic? I am hopeful. I believe we are enough. But I also have no illusions. When you drive around our churning city and see so many homes being torn down or built up, when the staircase to the oversized, gross, disgusting mansion isn't finished and the ugly retaining wall and drainage pipes are still exposed, or when gentrification knocks down the slanted, tipping over bungalow and the sad beauty of the land below is revealed anew. In such moments of phase shift in our city, we pierce through the illusion generated by finished buildings with finished trims, trim and unexposed pipes, the illusion of stability. We pierce through that illusion. Nothing is stable. Nothing is fixed except as we fix it. And that actually is our opportunity in this time in Seattle and the United States. If Roberto Maestas were here, he would remind us, let's not get too attached to this shiny new place. Let's keep on the lookout for another abandoned school to occupy. And without permission, let's make a compact with each other to teach each other how, when, and why to govern ourselves. Thank you very much. I see trees of green, red roses too. I see them bloom for me and you. What we're gonna do now is break up into the actual civic circles. And um, we'll chat for about 15 or 20 minutes or so about that, that idea that Eric brought up. How can we each work to reject the absolutism that is such a part of discourse right now? Um, that things are either good or bad, the binary way of thinking, and how can we hold ourselves accountable uh, for doing so and each other accountable? So go ahead and break up into groups of about six or seven, and then we will come on back to close it up. Thank you again for being here. Um, we'll see you at a circle or on August 4th. And thank you very much again to Estella and the team.